Hey guys, how's everybody doing? Welcome to another video lecture uh, for all you AP World History Champions out there. Um, I'm Mr. Weber and today we're going to be talking about um, Worlds Apart, the Americas and Oceania. This is kind of a neglected part of world history, I feel, at least in the last couple of months, and that we've been all Eurasia and Africa with not a whole lot of attention paid to the Americas and Oceania, which is I feeling like feeling like it's a little unfair, but we'll get into why a little bit we haven't really talked a ton about those places in comparison with Europe, Asia, and Africa. Um, but before we get into it, um, let me get myself out of the way here. Make myself a little bit smaller. Here, make myself tiny. Okay. Um, so here are some of the themes we're touching upon in this chapter. Um, we'll be looking a little bit about Cahokia being the center of the vast North American trade network and what that all entailed. Um, in terms of chronological reason, these are just some things you can look at. I'm not hugely enamored with them, but um, we're going to describe some of the social and economic continuities, um, continuities, sorry, it's late, um, in the post-classical Inca empire from the post-classical period states, or just classical period states. Comparison's a big one here. Um, you'll assess, one of the things you can look at is the advantages and disadvantages of a tributary empire and combat, compare that with Aztec, Inca, Mongol, and Chinese post-classical empires, but there'll be so many comparisons here that you should probably look at. And We'll also, in terms of historical imp interpretation and synthesis, um, we'll look at how the diffusion of fishing technologies in Polynesian societies could be seen as an, just as important as the spread of gunpowder or the horse collar in Eurasia. Okay, we'll look at that and you can see for yourself whether or not you think that argument is valid. Um, but first, a world roundup. So... In the world in about 1453, which is kind of the central area of time that we're looking at, just sort of a roundup, we'll go from east to west, so to speak. Remember, East Asia, as in pretty much all of Asia, is still kind of in the throes of post-Mongol-ness. Um, the Mongolians had conquered pretty much all of this territory. Um, China was sort of entering a period of after the Yuan dynasty, which is basically the Mongol dynasty. Same thing with India, sort of emerging into the Mughal dynasty, which is sort of a post-Mongol dynasty. And other areas are sort of grappling with the kind of collapse of the Mongolian period. Europe, as you may remember from chapter 19, was undergoing a period in which um, they were fragmented into various kingdoms and beginning to find themselves as emerging as a more and more powerful entity, so to speak, with the emergence of trade from Italian city-states to the Middle East, thanks in large part to the reestablishment of trade and cultural networks um, established in the Crusades. Um, by 1453, Ottoman Turks had taken over large parts of what used to be sort of the Abbasid Empire and Persian Empires, and they begin their several hundred year long reign of this area. And we see Europe beginning to push out Islamic influence from European proper and trying to establish itself as a Christian, um, Christian continent. African kingdoms down here in West Africa were beginning to emerge as more and more viable trade states, as well as kingdoms in West Africa also. Um, so we see things start to emerge, but what we also have to realize is that in North and South America, there were civilizations developing there and with their own sort of cultural norms and political organizations, social organizations, and that whole aspect. But it's not as if they were completely different in every single way than their counterparts in Europe. And as we all well know, eventually these two cultures are going to merge with one another, They're going to come together and we'll see all of the various interactions that go along with it. Um, it's very easy for us to look at these civilizations within the context of comparing them to Europe, and it's kind of a natural thing to do. It's a flawed thing to do because we should try to look at these cultures for what they are. Um, we should look at them on their own individual merits rather as just something to be compared with something else. It's not exactly a fair way to look at it, but it's often a trap that we look at. Um, so that being said, 
Let's get into these folks. Um, we'll start with Mesoamerica and North America. As we saw previously, there's almost limit, limited to no contact with Africa, Asia, or Europe. As we saw in Chapter 19, there is a brief presence of Scandinavians in Newfoundland and Canada when they established the area known as Vinland. But all we know of is those people is that they went there and they apparently died. They didn't really leave any sort of lasting impact or prolonged contact between Europe and the Americas. Um, there was some Asian contact with Australia, but that's about it. Um, Mesoamerica by the 8th century found itself in a time of war and conquest and various regional states dominated the Central Valley of Mexico um, by that time. Um, the first group we see are the Toltecs who migrated, migrated from northwest Mexico, settled near an area known as Tula, which is near modern Mex modern day Mexico City. The high point of their civilization is between 950 and 1150 CE, with a population in their urban setting at around 60,000 people, which is about a little over half the size of Waukegan. Um, they got their power by the way that a lot of Mexican Valley civilizations did, by subjugating surrounding people. But eventually, their population population was destroyed by internal strife and various nomadic incursions, and it fell apart by 1175, or at least that's what we think. They didn't leave a whole ton of written records, so we don't quite know exactly for sure what happened to them, but based on what we do have, that would seem to indicate that's what happened. Um, move myself back over here, which brings us to the Mexica. Now, the Mexica is where obviously the country of Mexico gets its name from, and they are the people that generally we refer to as the Aztecs. Um, the Mexican flag, the centerpiece of it, which is right here, is based on the Mexica legend that they would find their homeland when they saw an eagle perched on a cactus with a snake in its talons, and supposedly when they went to, um, the, the Great Lake, the Lake Texcoco, in which Tenochtitlan was located, that's what they saw, and that's where we still get the um, emblem on the Mexican flag to this day. But they're one of several groups of migrant people living in mid-13th century CE, and they had a tradition of basically being bandits and kidnappers and just kind of bastardly people in a lot of ways. Um, they kidnapped women and basically kept them for ransom and took money from other more affluent civilizations, and basically that's what they did, or goods and things like that. They settled in Tenochtitlan, as the as the eagle would indicate, and they're actually quite ingenuitous. Um, they're very, very talented at dredging soil from the bottom of the lake to create little fertile plots of land known as chinampas, which allowed them to grow crops um, seven times a year, which allowed their population to flourish and do quite well. Um, and the way they whoops the way they worked was basically it allowed them to have constant water flowing to the roots and allowed them to just keep growing crops continuously um regard uh, regardless it's not a word regardless of not having much water in the Mexican valley which is often the case um and the city of Tenochtitlan is still somewhat of a thing of legend in that it's it was just huge and just this magnificent urban center. Um, and it was said to have rivaled the cities of Rome and London and Paris at the time. In fact, it hosted more people than Rome and London and Paris. It was actually probably a lot cleaner than those places since disposing of waste was a whole lot easier, what with all the canals and everything like that. Um, but it was a magnificent city and it obviously made famous here here in the Diego Rivera mural. In case you don't know who Diego Rivera is, he's actually famous for making a lot of very Mexico-centered murals. You see them all over the place, especially in Mexico. And he was also used to be tied with Frida Kahlo, who's the lady in, that's located in my classroom. So they used to, you know, do stuff together. They had a very interesting relationship nonetheless. But interestingly enough, Tenochtitlan was located on top of a lake, and that lake is where this place is now. Defe, Mexico City, built on top of a lake. It's actually a very marshy place, somewhat similar to Chicago in that aspect. But supposedly Mexico City sinks by about 10 inches a year in certain places. And whenever you're building something in Mexico City, you have to be very careful. Oh, we have a cat appearance. Say hello, Taft. Say hello to all your adoring fans. There he is. Okay. But anyway, 
moving along. The Aztec Empire was actually a, an alliance of the Mexica as well as other surrounding groups. Um, it was actually also known as the Triple Alliance between the Mexica, the Texcoco, and the Tlacopan Empires. Um, they made the Aztec Empire, but the Mexica were the main ones. They were the ones made famous, the ones we usually refer to when we think of the Aztecs. Um, they were very, very skilled warriors, and they were able to set up a tributary empire by the 15th century. And if you remember, a tributary empire is one in which you have a bunch of people ruled by a centralized government, and those people have to pay that government tribute, usually in the form of goods or oftentimes people, and in exchange, you're kept safe, you're allowed to trade within that network usually, and you don't get attacked by the centralized government, in this case the Aztecs. Very similar to what we see with the Mongolians, in which they take you over, and as long as you pay your taxes, your tribute, you're okay. The Chinese were very adept at doing this as well. So we see this sort of tributary relationship continuing in the Americas, even though they had no contact with the Chinese or the Mongolians ever. Somewhat interesting in that aspect. Um, Perhaps the more famous emperor was Moctezuma, who's also known as Moctezuma or Montezuma. And he was sort of the architect of this uh, triple alliance between the Texcoco and the Tlacopan empires. Um, and they established themselves in the middle of basically south central Mexico, which is obviously the location of Mexico City today. Um, very somewhat close to the Mayan Empire, and a lot of people, when they think of the Aztecs and the Mayans, they oftentimes confuse the two, and though they did have similarities in terms of their god structure um, and their culture, they were not totally the same. Um, one particular popular film, Apocalypto, mixes the two up. They basically portray Mayan culture as basically Aztec culture. However, the human sacrifice scene, which I would show to you on here, but we don't quite have time, is actually a fairly de accurate depiction of the Aztec uh, human sacrifice scenes we'd see to the Aztec god of the sun and war, Huitzilopochtli, um, during the period around when the Spaniards came. But the Aztecs were ones that, though the Apocalypto seems to make it seem like it's the Mayans, not so much the Aztecs. But in terms of Mexica society, just like many other societies, they're very hierarchical in nature. Um, very, very rigid social structure driven primarily with warfare. Soldiers received very, very high stature. If you fought well in the military, you could get some very, very just and large rewards, usually in the form of pieces of land or very, very nice food privileges. So land and food, whatever everybody wants. Um, but most of these warriors are drawn from the aristocratic class because they were the only people with means to sort of have the time and energy to train all the time. Guess what other people did? They worked. Um, there was also sumptuary privileges, which basically means you got to dress very nice. It was actually a rule. If you were a part of this high warrior class, you got to dress nice. If you were a part of the peasant or slave class, you had to dress bad. So you were not allowed to dress beyond your means. It'd be like if you weren't allowed to dress like a rich person today. So if you weren't allowed to wear Brooks Brothers or a, a nice jacket or something like that. If I wore this in Mexica times, I might be you know, punished in some way for wearing a, a sport coat, which may be seen as some sort of position of affluence. I think I actually got this from a thrift store, not going to lie. So anyway, moving along. In terms of society of the Mexica, women were subjugated to a patriarchal relationship. We see just like we see in Asia, just like we see in Europe, just like we see in Africa, this patriarchal aspect of society. It's a somewhat universal and, of course, unfortunate way of organizing a society. Their emphasis was on childbearing, especially if you bore warrior children. Um, mothers of warriors were especially prized within Aztec society. Um, priests were also hugely important. If you remember the scene from Apocalypto, if you ever saw that, the one who's orchestrating the whole massive ceremony that seemingly thousands of people are watching on in adoration, um, it's a priest. And a lot of times these priests were also sort of political rulers as well. It's very similar to what we see in um, Mesopotamian society in which you have sort of priestly ruling class type folks where you, if you were considered to be a direct, in direct communication with the god hierarchy, you could run an entire place. Um, but they manage the ritual calendars, they manage the agricultural calendars, they manage all the 
various religious rituals. They read omens. They advised the rulers. They're extremely powerful people. Separation of church and state did not really exist in Mexica society. And a lot of times they became rulers also. Um, there was also, they were, they were put into large groups called Kapui, um, Kapuli or Kapui, whichever you want, way you want to pronounce it. But originally they were kin based. So it was like your family, it's like a clan, so to speak. You had a, a family group and like an extended family group that ran it and they managed communal lands. Um, and there was a work obligation to work on various aristocratic lands as well. And yes, there was also a slave class, but much like we saw in West African slavery, it was mostly people who owed debt. And in some cases, if people were really hard up, they had to sell their children into slavery. And in some cases, you saw people who got conquered as well, who were also sold into slavery. Um, in terms of another class of people, though, you had artisans and merchants, people who could work with gold, silver, cotton textiles, and tropical bird feathers, various um, quetzal plumes and that sort of thing. Skilled artisans, you oftentimes enjoyed a pretty comfortable lifestyle, um, and they're position was held in place thanks to merchants who were able to engage in long distance trade as long as the empire was held in stability thanks to Mexica warriors and that sort of thing. Um, they provided various exotic goods that wealthier people within Mexica society could purchase as well as political and military intelligence of other people who may want to attack the Mexica which was understandable because the Mexica oftentimes took people hostage uh, for human sacrifice purposes and often attacked people. They were not a very nice people and that's going to lead to problems. Whenever you have a tributary society, usually you're going to have a lot of people who are resentful of that society that is being maintained. You don't generally want to have a society which is basically run by a bully who takes your lunch money every day, which is essentially how that works. And a lot of times these areas fell into suspicion. There's just a lot of, a lot of mistrust between the Mexica and their tributaries. Um, and this is a nice um, diagram of their society. It's, it's very similar to what we see in the Middle Ages in Europe, in which you have people who pray, people who fight, and people who work. Um, but generally speaking, everybody was expected to fight. Um, but yeah, it, it was this sort of pyramid-based society that you see ad nauseum throughout human history. Um, and of course, none of it can really happen without the work of common people, farmers and slaves. You got to be able to eat. But the Aztecs had a very strict hierarchy, and for them it worked for a while until these guys come over from Spain and kind of wreck everything for them. As for Mexica religion, um, they are influenced by ind indigenous traditions from the Olmec period, people from way, way, way back in uh, the kind of pre-classical period of Mesoamerican society. And yes, they had the ritual ball game, which a lot of people say is a precursor to soccer, in which you had these hoops on the side of these sort of ball courts, in which you could only put a ball through the hoop by either hitting it with your knee or your hip, which to me seems impossible. I don't really know how you could do it, um, but that was part of their religion. And in some cases, the losing team were sacrificed. They had a very elaborate calendar, though not as elaborate as the Mayan calendar. And fun fact, Fun fact, if you take the 1, 2, 5, and 10 peso coin in, in Mexico and put them together, it makes an Aztec calendar. How fun is that? How neat is that? So if you have any 1, 2, 5, and 10 pesos lying around, you could go ahead and try that. I don't have pesos per se, but I was told by um, this um, world history forum I follow online that you can do that. So if you have any, that'd be an interesting thing to check out. Um, their gods were everything. Um, the Mexica were very religious. The Spanish were very religious. So we'll see how that turns out when the two encounter each other about a hundred years into the future of the dates that make up this chapter. Um, one of their main gods was the Scatlipoca, the smoking mirror. Um, depicted here with a modern day drawing. Um, basically, he was, he was the god of life and death. Um, he was the patron, one of the patron god of warriors and supposedly had a, a mirror that sort of, you know, gave omens and gave predictions on how one's life will work out. Two of the more famous ones is Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, um, who was kind of a god of not only the 
Aztecs, but also the Maya as well, um, who was kind of a patron god of arts, crafts, and agriculture. Um, there was this sort of belief that the Aztecs thought that the Spanish were Quetzalcoatl who returned on the same calendar year. That's actually not entirely true. That was kind of said after the fact by those who happened to survive the Spanish attack. Um, and we're basically trying to find ways to sort of explain how such a catastrophe could have occur occurred. It was basically legends created after the fact. They didn't really occur before the fact. And, of course, the gods, the god of the sun slash war, Huitzilopochtli, very popular in the 14th century of the Mexica, very popular god. And his emphasis was blood sacrifices. And supposedly to make Huitzilopochtli happy, you had to sacrifice warriors. And the, he lived off of the blood of warriors. Um, and bloodletting was a huge part of Mexican or Mexica um, religion. Um, their emphasis on human sacrifice was much greater than their predecessor cultures. They would, in some cases, sacrifice a hundred people in a single single day um, just to sort of keep their gods happy. Um, sometimes their sacrificial victims had tips of their fingers torn off before death, the ritual wounds. One of their rain gods, Tlaloc, supposedly thrived off of the sacrifice of children, in particular crying children. Um, the more pain you inflicted on a child and more tears the child cried before they were sacrificed was considered to make the god Tlaloc happy. So according to the Mexica tradition, if it's raining out, that means a god who likes to see little kids tortured and crying and then sacrificed and murdered is what rain is. So that's kind of a sick and twisted way to think of rain. Um, and also there were other rituals of piercing of the penis as well as earlobes, tongues, and that sort of thing. Um, the Mexica religion was extremely brutal and violent, which gives us a glimpse as to, into the people themselves. Um, what kind of world are these people living in where they have such a violent type of religion? It gives you a glimpse of that. And it just tells you sort of the level of violence that must have occurred in the Mexican Valley for this to become kind of the norm. It must give us an indication that violence Violence was regular. Violence was a normal thing to these people. It wasn't anything that was seen as too out, outlandish or things like that. Um, but whenever you see a violent culture like that, you have to consider what were the circumstances that went into it. We see some of, somewhat of the same thing in Mesopotamia as well, in which you have a lot of different cultures fighting each other to be in the top position. People like the Assyrians would emerge, in which violence is a very common part of their culture. Um, they, it just kind of becomes embedded in it, and the, Mex the, the Mexica were very, very similar in that regard. Which brings us up to North America. Um, now, the people and societies of North America have far less written record of them, so consequently we know a lot less. Um, the Pueblo and Navajo societies, which were located in the American um, Southwest, which is basically kind of around here, um, lived predominantly on maize, um, which is basically like a type of corn. 80% of their diet was corn-based. Um, We've got a, a visitor here, William Hart Taft. William Hart Taft, what do you think of the, the Eurocentric approach that a lot of um, historians often take? Think it's messed up? Yeah, me too. Me too. So anyway... Um, by 700, they constructed permanent stone or adobe dwellings, which you can still see in many cases today. Um, the Iroquois and woodland people who lived um, west of the Mississippi, or sorry, east of the Mississippi, um, basically the Native Americans that lived in areas like around here, um, were, were very common. Um, and we see still some of the remnants, at least in terms of some of the names of places around here, like the Potawatomi Native Americans. You hear the Potawatomi Casino up in Milwaukee, as well as some of the names. In fact, the name Waukegan is actually a Potawatomi name that means little fort. So fun fact about that. Um, but there are also the mound building people, um, people who lived in the Midwest, especially the, uh, the mounds in, in Ohio, and also the large settlement of Cahokia, which is a huge mound near East St. Louis. Cahokia 
was a site um, of, of trade, and trade was a major, major driver of North American societies, but we don't know a whole lot about them. Um, we do know that there, were, there are indications that there were widespread trades, and there are all these trade routes. In fact, the city of Chicago was a major trading network post of various Native Americans. The Chicago River was a key river used for trade, um, and that trade connected to um, other rivers, and it also connected to the Mississippi River, which is why Cahokia was as large as it was. Um, the Des Plaines River was also a huge river as well for Native American trade. In South America, we see other states and empires emerge. Um, there was no writing that existed until the Spaniards arrived, so again, we don't know a ton about them. If they didn't leave in a written record, it, we're, we struggle to find remnants, but they do have certain um, artifacts and settlements, well, ruins left behind like we see at Machu Picchu. Unlike Mesoamerican cultures, uh, writing from... Um, the fifth century did emerge a little bit, um, but not a whole lot. Archaeological evidence would reveal that there was an Andean society in the first millennium BCE, and they had developed some sort of semblance of cities somewhere between 1000 and 1500 CE. Um, but the most famous of the South American societies were the Inca, the Incas. Um, after the displacements of Chavin and Moche societies, which are the other South American societies, the development of an autonomous regional state in the Andean South America came about. At first, there was the kingdom of Chiquito, um, who emerged at Lake Titicaca. Yes, Lake Titicaca. Taft, do you find that funny? Taft doesn't find it funny at all, so neither should you guys. Okay, um, But they were very, very adept at potato cultivation, like this happy potato right there, as well as the herding of llamas and alpacas, two of the funnier-looking animals. But apparently llamas are jerks. Do you know that, Taft? Did you know that llamas are jerks? Hey, look at me. He doesn't even care. doesn't even care. Good boy. Loves history. Anyway, the kingdom of Chimu, or Chimor, emerged on the uh, Peruvian coast. They had a capital city at Chanchan. Um, but that's just a little bit about the Incas in terms of how they emerged. We'll get into more of their administrative structure here. Um, the Inca Empire emerged in the valley of Cusco, which is in modern-day Peru. Um, it refers to people who spoke the Quechua language. It's actually a language still spoken in Andean societies today. Um, but settlements around Lake Titicaca, hee hee, Taft still doesn't find it funny, um, around the mid-13th century, he finds it so, he, he can't even be here anymore, he's, he's really upset, really, really upset. Um, but the greatest amount of territory under the India, or sorry, Incan ruler Pachacuti, um, who was also named Earthshaker, that is not a picture of the Earthshaker, that is a picture of Earthquake, who was a famous... WWF wrestler in the early 90s, late 80s. He's he's a hero in many ways. But anyway, Pachacuti was a major um, mover and shaker, uh, pun intended. Um, oh, and I have sound effects now, so when I tell a great joke like that one, we can laugh about it. <laughs> Anyway, um, the Inca Empire emerged in modern-day modern, per, modern day Peru, parts of Ecuador, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. At one point, it had a population of 11.5 million, which is a very, very large empire, considering the other empires at that time, even in Europe, oftentimes did not even come close to that of the Inca Empire. And yes, they were the creator of the settlement of Machu Picchu, which everybody and their mom seems to have been to except me. Someday I'll get to go to Machu Picchu, but probably not anytime soon. But um, it's supposedly one of the most breathtaking sites you can ever lay eyes on. It's up in the mountains, and it's just amazing to see that a group of people could build something like that in such a sort of remote-looking place. But anyway, there's the Inca Empire. It was a society built on the mountains, which makes it safe and which makes it somewhat isolated. Um, the other thing about these Mesoamerican, South American, North American cultures, they didn't have the advantage of diffusion. Um, they weren't like Eurasia, which was able to sort of send technology and culture, you know, east and west pretty easily. Sending technology and culture north and south is not that easy, especially with the landforms, too. You got to get across this very, very 
very narrow isthmus of Panama up into Mexico if you're going to diffuse anything. And that's not always easy to do, especially if you maybe have people that aren't very hospitable right there. So basically, the Mexica didn't really have any idea what the Inca were doing and vice versa. And they certainly didn't really have much of a clue as to what was going on up in North America. Um, so not a whole lot of exchange and interchange between these cultures. They weren't able to learn each other. They didn't have that advantage like we see in Europe, Asia, and Africa um, of being able to share ideas and grow as cultures and be able to have these advantages. And this is going to hurt them drastically when Europeans come over um, in the 1500s, late 1400s. Um, but in terms of Inca administration, one bit you'll always see is the the kipu, um, the the system of cords and knots to sort of pass along messages along the Inca roads in which you had runners basically pass along these messages. It was probably the closest thing they had to a system of writing um, that we can find, um, but that was about it. Um, Inca rulers ruled by holding hostage. If you were a conquered people and you were being seen as being somewhat rebellious, they would hold your leaders hostage. And if you were nice, they would basically let them go. If you were not nice, they would send their own loyals loyal people as colonists of your civilization. And if you're really bad, they would just kind of crush you. Um, Cusco was the capital of the Incan Empire. Um, very, very elaborate cities. It was the place where your highest nobility lived, your priests, as well as the hostages who were not being nice to the Incan Empire. There's a lot of gold facings on buildings, which obviously enticed the Spaniards when they would come. The ruler of the Inca was the um, the Inca, that's where we get the name Inca from. Usually Inca refers to just as the person, but we call the whole people that. Um, and generally speaking, they were much like other sort of uh, early civilizations in that they were seen as not only their leaders, but almost as semi-divine. And in some many cases, the Inca were expected to only marry members of their own family because they were the only people seen as worthy of siring a child born by them. So that meant oftentimes you had Inca marrying their brothers or sisters and things like that, which to us is obviously kind of disgusting and perverse, but to them that was normal. Um, the road system is also something very, very, very much written about. Um, it was actually more extensive than the Roman road network, approximately 10,000 miles. And a lot of these roads you can actually still hike on to this day. Um, it's also something I've always wanted to do. But it's paved, shaded, very wide, very easily accessible because it was the key to trade. It was a way to not only trade, but also send messages. And if you're going to have this large empire extending along the Andean coast, you need to have a road network to help people get there. And the way it was built by, it was built by member of the, members of the Incan Empire. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. First, let's talk a little bit about Incan society and religion. Hold your thoughts about the Incan roads. Um, basically, social elites dominated by an infallible king. Again, like a god. Infallible means you can't do anything wrong. He claimed descent from the sun, the sun god, in T. Um, and there's a lot of ancestor worship, something we see very, very commonly throughout not only in Mesoamerican and um, South American cultures, but kind of everywhere, the sort of ancestor worship. Remember, we saw it in Rome also, very, very popular in China as well. A lot of sacrifices offered, but no human sacrifices going on, going on in the Inca. They might sacrifice animals for sure, okay, maybe your occasional llama or two, but no human sacrifices. That was an Aztec and Mayan thing, not an Inca thing. So try not to confuse the two. Um, but in terms of their other elements of their societies, um, the aristocrats are like their nobles, the wealthy, powerful people, um, receive special privileges, most notably earlobe spools. So they got to have very huge studs in their earlobes. Hot dog, lucky them. Um, but their peasants were organized into community groups called Ailu, um, very, very similar to what we um, saw in Aztec society with the Kapuli, um, except it was a bit more of a forced thing. Um, land tools were held communally, and there was mandatory work done on land of, of aristocrats as well as public works. There was this system in Incan society called Mita, in which instead of paying taxes, you were instead expected to pay time. So a certain weeks or months out of the year, you were expected to work for the 
the rulers, the aristocrats, whether that meant like building roads or building terraced farms to produce food, you're expected to do some work, not for yourself, not for your family, but for the entire empire. And that was called Mita. And so it, this is kind of a picture of how that might have looked. You were kind of almost like a slave for a little while, but it was sort of a way of sort of paying your taxes. So rather than pay money, you pay actual labor. Um, in terms of their gods, Inti, as I mentioned before, was their sun god, sun god. Viracocha, uh, Viracocha rather, was their creator god, and their temples were seen as pilgrimage sites. A lot of travel in the Incan Empire, so going to these pilgrimage sites was also seen as something you were expected to do, so all much more of an impetus to keep the roads going. Um, peasant sacrifices... Um, were common, but again, it was usually only of produce and animals, not humans. Um, sin was seen as a disruption of the divine order. So if you sinned, you had to ask for forgiveness so that you didn't mess up the order of things. Um, we shift now to Oceania, and that's basically all of the many, very, all the many islands of the Pacific. So now we get real worldly in world history. Um, we're talking about everybody. Um, first, we'll start off with the nomadic foragers of Australia, commonly referred to as Aborigines. Um, it's a virtually static culture in that it didn't really change for a long period of time. Um, not until Australians, well, not until British people came and colonized Australia did it really change. And the only way it really changed is they're oftentimes forced off their land or forced to convert to Australian mainstream British-based society. Um, there is a, there is a famous song that's totally escaping me right now um that that that's basically talking about the disruption of aboriginal culture it's basically how can we dance or how can we dance when the world is burning and that's sort of like it's the time has come to pay them back and anyway maybe i'll play it for you guys in class but um not a whole lot of agriculture very much hunter gatherer societies um and rather brutal society especially when you consider they live in the australian outback which is not a very very pleasant place to live very dry very hot um shifting over to new guinea which is kind of a large island in the pacific um swine herding and root cultivation occurred a bit but again not whole big pieces of widespread agriculture not really enough land to do that um there was a small scale trade of surplus food and some goods. In some cases, we see the use of oyster shells as a means of currency, as well as spears and boomerangs, but nothing huge in terms of trade like we see in even the Incan society, certainly nothing close to you know something going along with like the Silk Roads. Um, in terms of cultural and religious traditions, they were animistic. And if you're animistic, that means you have ties to the environment in terms of your religion. So it's like you worship a tree god, a sun god, a rain god, that sort of thing. Um, you believe that spirits exist in animals. You maybe have a spirit animal. The idea of a spirit animal comes to these sorts of animistic traditions. Um, and there's all sorts of myths and stories about geological features to try to explain life. Um, for example, example, it was believed in Australian Aboriginal society that a woman, when a woman got pregnant, it wasn't because of, you know, something like sexual intercourse. They didn't really know that sexual intercourse led to pregnancy. They believed it was some sort of nearby spirit god that had got her pregnant, um, which means that oftentimes they didn't necessarily have exclusive relationships between men and women. It was basically like a tribe and you basically got intimate with whomever and if they got pregnant it was the tribe's child not necessarily one single person's child um but there are all sorts of rituals to help maintain that society to ensure continuing food supply and to can ensure society was ordered in the way that it was ordered in terms of who is to do the hunting who is to do the gathering who is to do the child rearing and all that sort of stuff all sorts of religious traditions to maintain that and all of it loosely tied to the environment as well as geological features so like rocks wind dirt soil that sort of thing and these are your societies of ocean. You have Polynesia, which is kind of like the Hawaiian Islands and these areas over here that are closer to North and South America. Micronesia and Melanesia, which is closer to Australia. Australia, New Zealand, and New Guinea. So basically, these are the areas that we are talking about. 
Um, the development of Pacific societies in, um, occurred in various islands in the early centuries BC, and there were was trade between island groups. Um, long distance voyaging occurred in an intermittent basis, so not too often. But they did bring sweet potatoes from South America, and we do have pretty extensive proof that there was some interaction between them, but not anything prolonged or widespread. Um, the voyages to these faraway places were preserved in oral traditions, but nothing prolonged or maintained that we can really see. Um, however, populations did grow and did lead to future problems um, with extensive cultivation of certain uh, crops. Populations were able to grow as more and more people were able to eat, um, kind of like what we saw in Europe with crop rotation uh, and the development of beans in Europe led to more and more people. We see the sort of the same things here. Um, fish ponds allowed small fish through and it trapped larger fish. So basically they got much more adept at basically their fish-based diet. However, with the growth of populations and population density, that led to social strife, especially if you couldn't necessarily sustain those food sources, and it led to economic degradation. And in certain cases, we hear instances of fighting as well as cannibalism. And it's these issues of cannibalism that gain probably a disproportionate amount of attention than it deserved and that many, many Europeans began to see these groups as just sort of fiercely cannibalistic and that's it. Whereas cannibalism probably was more of a means of deterrence in many cases and that basically people who were seen as outsiders or potentially dangerous or harmful would be cannibalized or eaten as a way to deter but wasn't necessarily the norm. Um, but anyway, that's... Um, a brief rundown of the major themes and information from chapter 20. Um, finally starting to see some civilizations in North South America as well as Oceania. Um, moving forward, we will see how the relationship between these isolated societies would occur with the other isolated, to a degree, societies of Eurasia uh, as well as Africa. Um, and we'll see that relationship continue on and on and on, as well as comparisons between these groups um, and these all sorts of new societies that would emerge from it. Um, don't forget to read the chapter. The chapter is the chapter is key. Don't ever think of this as an adequate substitute, but it's not a bad idea to necessarily look at this. And who knows, you may see something that I messed up. If you let me know, who knows, maybe I'll give you some extra credit or something like that. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, William Howard Taft is just absolutely pooped from all the history talk. Look at him. He's just exhausted. But anyway, thanks for watching. And... Go read some stuff. You guys are great. Take care.